Welcome to the weekend live stream for C3 Church in Southwest Washington. Some of you are joining us from home, others are with your friends and your family, and some of you are with your small groups. We are going to have an incredible time together. Before we begin, there are a few things that we are going to do together in order to get the most out of our time together. First, we are going to gather everyone together around the screen. It is time for church. Next, and this is for those of us watching at home on our smart devices on social media, we're going to click that share button to extend the invitation to all of our friends and family who are online now or later to join us. And don't forget that likes, comments, and emojis are a great way to interact with all of those who are also watching the live stream. Now here's the most important part of all. This isn't a video. This is live stream church, C3 Church Southwest Washington style. So now, unless you are physically unable to do so, you're going to stand with me so that we can prepare for what's to come next. We are a church that is always leaning forward in everything that we do. So again, stand with me. Awesome. Now, to get warmed up, we are going to take the next 10 seconds to clap, shout, and cheer. No, I am not kidding, because this is how we are going to let everyone in the room and all of heaven know that we are excited to be here, we are excited to be together, and we are excited for all that God is going to say and do in this time that we have together. So ready for the next 10 seconds, clap, shout, and cheer on the count of three, two, one. Wow, that was awesome. I am 100% confident that in the rest of our time together, when it's time to stand, you're going to stand. When it's time to sing, you're going to sing. When it's time to clap, you're going to clap. When it's time to pray, you're going to pray. When it's time to say amen, you're going to say amen. All right, for one last time, let me hear some noise. And now we are ready to begin. Hello C3 family, love you and wish we could be face to face, but this is the next best thing. In Isaiah 41:10, it says, don't be afraid for I am with you. Don't be discouraged for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. Isaiah wrote this during a time when Israel was scattered. They were all over the place. They were not together. And so they were discouraged. But God sent them a word through Isaiah. And he says, don't worry. Don't be discouraged. I am going to be with you. I love the translation in the message. It says, I've picked you. I haven't dropped you. Don't panic. I am with you. There's no need to fear, for I'm your God. I'll give you strength, I'll help you, I'll hold you steady, keep a firm grip on you. Right now we might all feel scattered, we aren't together, we are not under one roof. But right here, God told the people of Israel, don't worry, I've got you, don't be discouraged, because I will keep you. And God says that to you today also, C3 family, there we go. <laughs> that He has you. Don't be discouraged. He will keep you because He has His victorious right hand. So as we step into worship, don't be discouraged, but be encouraged. Know that God has us. He is holding us together. Step in and experience God in His fullness because He's got us in His hands. One thing I'm asking, one thing I'm needing, a moment that's passing, it's not what I'm seeking, like it's the air I'm breathing, I want your presence, feet on the earth, heart full of heaven, still for you, completely consumes me, I can't get enough, can't get
I'm so excited about the opportunity we have to pray together. But before we do, I want to challenge you with a thought. In the book of Daniel, the prophet tells us of all these visions that he had. Very disturbing at times. He didn't understand what God was trying to tell him. And so he began to pray. In chapter 10 of Daniel, it says that he prayed and he fasted for three weeks. And then his answer came. He saw a vision, a man who was wearing linen, whose face flashed with lightning, his eyes had flames of fire, and his voice roared like a multitude. And the answer came to him in chapter 10, verse 12. It says, Then he said, Don't be afraid, Daniel, since the first day you began to pray for understanding and the, to humble yourself before your God, your request has been heard in heaven. I have come in answer to your prayer. That verse tells us that the minute that request left Daniel's mouth, the answer was on its way, but it came with a fight. Daniel was going to have to fight for that answer. Today, as we enter into prayer, know that we are going to have to fight for those answers, for those prayers to be answered. In Ephesians 6.12, it tells us that we fight and we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, but against powers that rule the darkness. Begin to pray. Begin to know that your answer is coming, but it comes with a fight. Don't give up. Don't surrender. Don't throw in the towel. Know that your answer is on its way. Now, let's join some family members as we pray. Father, we ask you to be with President Trump and Governor Inslee during this time. Please help our local mayors as they make decisions. Please protect our first responders as they fight to protect truth, justice, and freedom and keep us safe. Please bring a revival to America as it's fallen right now. Do Lord, please help southwest washington as we grow towards you let us get a visitation from you 
Please, dear God, let there be salvation for all, especially in our region. Please be with our economy in this time right now and in our hearts as we learn to love you. In Jesus' name. Father, I pray that you bless our C3 family. I pray that you bless our leaders and our pastors who are spreading your hope in this world in a time that greatly needs it right now. I pray for the pastors um, in Portland and Newburgh, the Brooks and the Crawfords, as they're building your church down there. And I pray for Pastor Drew and Emma Davies as they're planting a church in Seattle in a crazy time to be planting a church. Thank you, Lord, that you are blessing their efforts, that, that everything they've done, Lord God, they've seen your hand, Father God. I pray that you continue to do that. Help them to reach people in this time, um, even though it's a, a difficult time to be planting a church, that they would continue to grow um, their leadership base and their, their people that they're reaching. I pray for Pastor Carrie and Rianne, who are in Australia while they're pastoring a church in Frisco. Um, thank you that, Father God, even though they're separated um, in, in distance, Father, that they're still able to lead that church and they've got a great team leading with them. I pray that you just bless each of these pastors. And I pray for Pastor Stephen Rowena here um, in the Vancouver area. I pray that you help them navigate this time in meeting with people and meeting each other's needs and continuing to spread your hope and your love. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Father, we ask you to pour out your blessing on our church family, Father God. I pray for financial favor, whether it be a new job, Father, a promotion at work, additional side jobs, Father God. I pray for new businesses that are just starting now. I pray for existing businesses that maybe have been hit hard by this pandemic, Father God. I pray for our children and our grandchildren, Father God. I pray that they may come to know you and to love you and to serve you, Father God. And I pray for guidance and wisdom for those of us trying to raise them, Father God. I pray for our relationships, Father God, that you, as we grow deeper in relation with you, Father God, that you continue to touch and bless our relationships and our marriages, Father God. And I pray for health, strength, and healing, Father God, for anyone in our church family who may need it, Father, that they may know that they are not alone, Father God, no matter what the world says, no matter our current circumstance, Father God. I pray that they know that they are not alone, that we have you, because you are always here for us, Father God, in Jesus' name. Tune in and be a part of our C3 Kids live stream happening every Sunday at 945 on our C3 Kids Facebook page. Come and learn from our teachers and kids about Jesus and grow with our C3 Kids families. Also want more resources for your family? Text KIDS to the number on your screen for access to our C3 Kids Facebook page, for the C3 Kids Spotify and YouTube music playlist and more. See you this week online. My city, the new school year may be starting up, but we've got one last chance to celebrate summer and have some fun. Come out to the Hub Wednesday, August 26th for a free grilled hot dog and ice cream, plus outdoor competitions and games. Come hungry and ready to play. The doors open at 6 and dinner is at 6.30. Text my city to the number below for more info. It's time for our annual Labor Day cook-off. Every year, contestants compete for the title of best as our entire church family gathers together to celebrate. Come out to the C3 Hub on Sunday, September 6th at 5.30 p.m. Yeah. <laughs> for games, prizes, and a free meal for the whole family. This year's cook-off categories are chili and cookies. Contestants of all ages can choose to compete in one or both categories. Yes, they can. And must submit their dish name no later than Thursday, September 3rd. To enter your dish for the cook-off or to let us know that your family will be attending, please text Labor Day to the number below. 
Good luck to all our contestants. Hey church, well, it's great to be back with you. It's uh, this moment where I get to encourage you around your giving right now. So I want you to lean in right now and listen to just uh, a few words that I've got to say. When you think of a trigger like me, the first thing that I think of is a gun. Uh, the gun that has that little trigger, that thing that you put your finger on. Uh, the, the gun is ex absolutely useless until you actually take a hold of that trigger, squeeze the trigger, and, and then the squeezing of that trigger actually causes a motion of consequences after that. So think about it like this. You shoot the wrong thing, then the motion can actually cause you to find yourself behind some bars for a number of years if you shoot the wrong thing. Shoot the right thing, then you might find yourself sitting at the table tonight eating one of the greatest meals you could ever think of in your life. The trigger. Triggers. Uh, let's, let's think about that because that's not the only trigger. I don't know if you've had that moment where you've been driving down the road in your car, then, then that song comes on, and, and then straight away it triggers a memory of the ex-girlfriend or the ex-boyfriend or some relationship that uh, you were connected to. Uh, triggers, that there are moments when people say something and it triggers an emotion. It might trigger anger, it might trigger some anxiety on the inside of you. Triggers. I had someone recently tell me that when they drive down a particular road, it, it triggers memories of anxiety. Uh, another individual told me that they were walking into a particular, every time they walk into this particular shop, it, it triggers memories of the past triggers there, there are so many triggers when I was a kid at school the, the, the running races uh, at school they would line us up we were about to do the hundred meter sprint and the, the teacher on the side of the track on your marks get set and he pulls out at the gun he points it to the sky and he squeezes that trigger the sound of that trigger causes us to run at high speed to win the race triggers. Then there was that moment, incredible day that you remember. I mean, you've got albums, you've got photographs. Uh, we we're talking about that great day that you got married, for those of you that got married. But th there was a moment you said, I do. And, and, it, and it was at that moment that those words, I do, set the, the motion of consequences. Either you're, you're living in heaven or hell, depending on you who you said, I do too. But then there's spiritual consequences, triggers. So, so there's consequences in the physical, in the emotional, but there's also triggers in the spiritual. Think about this, that, that there was a time when you came to Jesus and you said, Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. As soon as you did that, uh, immediately that caused forgiveness coming towards your life. That there was a time you said, Jesus, would you come into my life? It was at that moment that there was a, a emotion that took place. You're no longer separated from God. You're now connected. You're now a friend of God. You're now part of His family. You now have uh, eternity in heaven with Him. It's, it's an incredible thing. Now, if I was to tell you there's one trigger that you set off that brings favor and blessing into your life, wouldn't you want to know what it is? I'm sure you would. Malachi chapter 3, it says, To bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see that I will not open up the floodgates of heaven and pour out blessing into your life. But there is a trigger that takes place. When, when, when you decide to bring your tithe, when you decide to, to, to sow into the house of God, I tell you, what happens is it triggers blessings of abundance into your world. Jesus said it like this in the book of Luke. He said, give and it shall be given. Pressed down, shaken together, running over, it will be poured into your lap. Oh my goodness, I don't know if you just heard that, but come on, man, when you decide to give, man, not only does God just give back to you, but He causes the abundance over and above anything you can think or imagine. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, there's another one. It says, if you give with generosity, guess what? Generosity comes back to you. I remember 10 days out from getting married. There I was in a situation, I didn't have a high paying job, in fact I was barely surviving. I didn't have enough money to pay for the wedding coming up. We were in miracle land at that point. And then my car decided to break down while I was in need of a car. While my wife, she worked in one side of the city, I was on the other side, we needed a car. And I remember wondering, believing God for some supernatural miracle. And one day I get a phone call 10 days out, this business guy said to me, he says, I hear, now I don't even know who this guy was. 
He, he knew of me. I knew of him, but we didn't have a relationship. I never sat with him and had a coffee with him. But he said, I hear that you need a car. I said, I'm in desperate need of a car. He said, good. He said, I want you to go to such and such car yard. There's a car and a Honda Accord that's sitting on that yard. It's all yours. Well, I turned up there, an $8,000 car had been sitting there for I don't know how many weeks, but point was is that he said, just sign the paperwork, I got it covered, the car is yours. Well, how did that happen? The story I didn't tell you is prior to that, I'd sewn a number of different cars to people that were in need, people that, 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 that needed a car, I sewed a car into them. Someone that was doing it tough, I sewed a car. I sewed cars and therefore God abundantly bought this amazing car back into my life. I'm telling you this, that when you bring a seed of generosity, what happens, it comes back to you. My question for you right now is this, is that would you be willing to set off the trigger of blessing and favor into your life? Come on, let's get ready. Come on, I know it's easy for us to switch off at this time, but I'm gonna pray a prayer right now. What I'd love you to do is I want you to grab your hand like this, make a fist right now. Let, let it be a representation of the seed, the finances that you have sown. Maybe in the last week or in the last few days, maybe the, the seed that you're about to plant, but kind of encourage you as an individual, as a couple, come on, make sure we're planting seed. Come on, we're about to trigger favor and blessing into our life. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we take this seed, as we take our weekly tithes and offering, we sow it into the house of God. I believe in Jesus' name. Father, we trigger blessing upon blessing. I pray for my brothers and sisters in the name of Jesus. I pray heaven to come. I declare favor. I pray pay rises, blessing, uh, increase to come around about their world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, release that. Come on, let me challenge you. Go and release some seed and believe God for what He's about to do in and through your life. Go and trigger the blessing and favor in your life.
Hey church family, many of you already know that Rowena and I will be taking some time off in August, but not to worry. We'll be enjoying some of the best speakers on the planet, and you can expect our normal Sunday morning live stream on Facebook and YouTube, as well as our live stream watch parties and our Sunday uh, 5.30 live gathering, all of which will be awesome as always. That being said, let's dive into our series, The Best Worst. In Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, we read these words, You planned evil against me, but God used those same plans for my good. These were the words Joseph expressed to his brothers some 15 years after they sold him into a human trafficking ring, which led to him becoming a slave in the house of Potiphar, which led then to his incarceration. And then through a bizarre twist of events, he found himself before Pharaoh to interpret a God-given dream about an upcoming drought. When Pharaoh saw the touch of God on his life to interpret the dream and the wisdom he possessed, he placed Joseph in charge of the entire plan to keep the nation from experiencing famine, which then brought him back together with his brothers who needed food. And as they stood before him, they were afraid for their lives. And after all they did to Joseph, they should have been. But Joseph saw the hand of God in it all. He saw the best in spite of the very worst. And he went on to express a profound biblical truth when he said, you planned evil against me, but God used those same plans for my good. Our series, The Best Worst, leans into this very idea that God is able to do some of his very best work in our lives during some of the very worst of circumstances. So today, I want you to grab your Bible, your pen, your paper, and enjoy this special message from Pastor Drew Davies, who with his wife, Emma, are planting a C3 church in Seattle, Washington. You know that Drew is a close friend who has served here in our local house, and you will absolutely appreciate the word he has prepared for you today. Enjoy. Hey, C3 Southwest Washington, so great to be with you today. Pastor Drew here from Hope Village Church up in Seattle. Hey, before I say anything else, I wanna take a moment to honor your pastors, Pastor Steve, Pastor Rowena, two of the greatest people in the world. You are in a great, great church. And I know you already know that, but I'm just saying that to you today. But it's such a real privilege for me to be sharing with you this message today online. And uh, I'm gonna to preach to you today from one of my favorite films. This film has I'd say it's shaped my life. It's certainly shaped uh, my, my, my childhood, my adolescent years. And I'm not talking about Braveheart. I'm not talking about Rocky. I'm not even talking about Titanic. I'm talking about the film Dumb and Dumber. Dumb and Dumber. Some of you hopefully are familiar with it. But there's this scene in Dumb and Dumber where Lloyd, Jim Carrey, has just been robbed by a sweet old lady on a motorized cart. He's come home to his trashy apartment and he falls to the ground. And he says to Harry, I've got no food, got no jobs, our pet's heads are falling off. <laughs> and it's a funny scene and you know, for the sake of like, for the sake of the illustration, okay, I know you and I have not had necessarily a moment where our pet's heads are falling off, okay? But I think you and I would all agree that we've had rock bottom moments in our life, just like Lloyd in Dumb and Dumber. And I can remember when I was 16, I was working at a, a fast food restaurant. And this was not a good fast food restaurant. You got Red Robin, you got McDonald's, you got Taco Bell, then you got this restaurant, which I'm not gonna say for legal reasons. But I remember when I was 16, getting fired from this job because I wasn't a good fit, they said. Okay, um, I moved on, my life got better. But I remember walking home as a 16 year old feeling like such a failure, such a, a rock bottom moment of my life. I can remember being 18, losing my driver's license. I had this problem where I thought I was Vin Diesel and The Fast and the Furious was a big film at the time and so I felt like I was entitled to drive like Vin Diesel, but apparently you're not allowed to do that. So I can remember getting the bus, getting the train, walking. It's pretty, pretty when, you've, when you've been driving for a couple of years and, and you have to do that, it's pretty embarrassing, it's pretty humbling. Just a rock bottom moment of my life, losing my driver's license. Now the next one's not funny, so don't laugh. But I remember seven years ago, just after my daughter had been born, Georgia, 
Emma getting quite sick and having to go to the hospital. And the doctor's not sure about what's gonna happen here. They, they thought she might have a blood condition. They thought she may have had a blood condition called sepsis, which kills a lot of people. And I can remember, it was the 4th of July. I can remember it so clearly. I was laying in bed, holding my, my, my brand new baby girl. She's a month, just over a month old. To hear the fireworks going off and I had to look at her and hear the fireworks and people having fun and I thought to myself, golly, this is, this, this, is a, this is a tough moment. My wife's in the hospital. I haven't seen her all day. I don't know what she's going through. Doctors don't know what's wrong with her. 30 or 40% chance that she could die from what could be this disease. So we've all had rock bottom moments in our lives. And life is going to have low moments in it. Bad things happen. And sometimes they are the results of our poor choices. And then sometimes it's just life. It's just life, things happen. Bad things happen to good people. I'm not trying to be negative, I'm just telling you the truth. Bad things happen to good people. So today I'm not talking so much about how do we avoid bad things happening to us. I'm talking about how do we respond when bad things happen to us. So the title of my message today for all the, the note takers is the rock bottom response. Let me pray. And let's kick this off. God, I thank you for everybody watching today online. I thank you, God, that right now you're going to speak to people that there could be somebody today who feels like they're in a rock bottom moment. But I want to encourage them today that they're going to get through their rock bottom moment. Bless every person watching. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's kick off the story today of Job in Job chapter 1, verse 1. It says this, There was a man named Job, who lived in the land of Uz. He was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and he stayed away from evil. So that verse talks about who Job is. He's a, he's a good guy. Job's a good guy. He had seven sons and three daughters, which is a lot of children. That's a lot. That's, that's, that's a Brady Bunch on steroids. He had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camel, 500 oxen, 500 donkeys, many servants. He was, in fact, the richest person in the entire area. So those two verses there, verse two and three, talk about what Job had. So basically, Job was a baller. Job was making it rain, hail, and shine. He was killing it. Now, to summarize verse four through to verse six, it talks about how awesome Job's family is, how awesome Job was as a father. Basically, the bottom line is this. Life was really good for our friend Job. Now let's skip down to verse 13. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting at the oldest brother's house, a messenger arrived with this news. Your oxen were plowing with the donkeys when the Sabaeans raided us. They stole all the animals and killed all the farmhands. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Verse 16, while he was still speaking, another person arrived. Person number two shows up, knocks on the door and says, I've got some bad news for you. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up all your sheep and all the shepherds. While he was still speaking, a third person comes. He says, three bands of the, of the Chaldean raiders have stolen your camels and killed your servants. And while he was still speaking, a fourth person comes up. How bad is this? This is the worst day of all time. A fourth person arrives and says, hey, uh, I've got some bad news for you. Your sons and daughters were feasting in, their oldest in your oldest brother's home. Suddenly a powerful wind swept in from the wilderness and hit the house from both sides. The house collapsed and all of your children are dead. And I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. So Job stood up. He tore his robe in grief. He shaved his head and he fell to the ground to worship. Job said this, he said, I came naked from my mother's womb and I'll be naked when I leave. The Lord gave me what I had and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. That's a bad day right there. Next time you're having a bad day because you stubbed your toe or you got a speeding ticket, just remember what happened to Job on the worst day of his life. But it gets worse. It gets worse. I'm sorry, it does. Job 2 verse 7. Uh, here we go. So now Job, gets, now Job gets sick. It gets worse. So here we go. Satan strikes Job with terrible boils from head to foot. Job scrapes his skin with a piece of broken pottery as he sits among the ashes. And his wife says to him, 
Are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Curse God and die. <laughs> but Job replied, you talk like a foolish woman. <laughs> I feel for Job here, guys. I feel for him. He has lost everything. Now he's losing his health. All that Job has left is his wife and she's nagging him. I mean, seriously. Then, then he says, should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? So in all of this, Job said nothing wrong. Okay, so let's put the, the story on pause for a moment here. Job was a good guy. We talked about earlier that, that sometimes bad things happens, happen to good people. And like I said before, today we're not trying to talk about how do you and I avoid bad things happening. We're talking about how do you and I respond when bad things happen? How do we respond to these rock bottom moments in life? In 2020, how are you going to respond to the rock bottom moments in your life? So I have three points to this message today. The first point is this, for you and I, not to lose our perspective. Don't lose your perspective. One thing we cannot lose in the most difficult moments of our lives is our perspective. The question I would ask myself in 2020 especially is, where does my mind go to in my low moments? Where do I look to? You see, what the devil would love more than anything else in the world is to get your eyes off of God, to get your eyes off of the Word of God, to get your eyes off of the promises of God. He would want you to get your eyes so low. He wants to get your eyes away from faith, away from hope, and into despair, into fear, into anxiety, into depression. But Psalm 121 says this, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. If you only get one thing from my message today, can it be that scripture? For you to lift your eyes, even when it's hard, even when 2020 may not be working out the way you thought it was going to. Can you lift your eyes today? I want to encourage someone today. Can you lift your eyes? The devil wants you to look down, but God wants you to lift your eyes to him. Someone say amen in church today. You know, Proverbs 3 Verse 5 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. There are some things in life that we will never understand. And that's okay. I will never understand how Chick-fil-A makes the most delicious Chick-fil-A sauce of all time. I'm never going to get it. And I don't need to understand it in order for me to enjoy the deliciousness of Chick-fil-A sauce. I'm never going to totally understand why Whenever you go into a public bathroom, why it's always wet. I'm not sure what happens in there. I don't know who was in there earlier. I'm never going to understand that. I'm never going to understand how my car works. And that's okay. I know when I get in my car, I press the button, it's going to start. Here's the thing. We don't need to understand something entirely in order for it to work. And we don't need to understand God entirely in order to trust Him. And I'm not talking about trusting God when everything is great. I'm talking about trusting God when everything's not great. Trusting God when you're in your rock bottom moment. And I would say this, I wonder this, I wonder this today. Sometimes when we are at our rock bottom moments, we often ask the wrong question. Our perspective gets us in the wrong question. And we ask God why, when we should be asking God what? Instead of asking God, why is this happening to me? Maybe the question we should be asking God is, what are you trying to do in me? What are you trying to do in me? Is it possible that the very rock bottom thing in your world that you have thought is going to ruin you, that you're asking why about, is actually the thing that's going to make you but you need to shift your perspective. Your eyes need to shift from why to what. Friend, there are things that are formed in us, in our rock bottom moments, that won't be formed if we ask the question why instead of the question what. Don't lose your perspective in the valley. 
Don't lose your perspective in 2020. Keep your perspective right. Keep it on the Word of God. Keep it on the promises of God. Keep trusting God, even when it does not necessarily make sense all the time. And remind yourself of this, Romans 8, 28. We know that all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. That's good news for somebody today. So number one, don't lose your perspective. My second point is this, don't lose your praise. Don't lose your praise. Don't lose your praise in your rock bottom moments. The Bible says that when Job lost it all, that he fell to the ground in worship. Did you know that praise is so important? Praise and worship is so, so important. The reason why it's important is because it's God's word in our mouth. What, what you need to not, not miss about this today is that praise and worship is powerful because it puts God's word into your mouth. And when God's word can go into your mouth, it can go into your circumstances and into the, into the situations that you find yourself in. Praise and worship, my friend, is a lifestyle. It's not 20 minutes on a Sunday. Praise and worship is a lifestyle. What songs do you play? in your rock bottom moment? What is the soundtrack to your 2020? If 2020 had a soundtrack, what would those songs be? What are you singing? What are you confessing with your mouth in 2020? You know, you know the, the music industry has made it very easy for us to throw ourselves a pity party. There, there is, there is a, a plethora of songs out there to help you and I be sad. You know what I'm talking about. You're having the greatest day of all time. You wake up, the sun is out, the birds are chirping, the weather is perfect. You go to get into your car, you thought you needed gas, but your spouse gassed up the car yesterday. You just bought yourself an extra five minutes. You stop by your favorite coffee shop, your favorite barista's on. You buy your latte. They say, you know what, it's on us today. You're here all the time, it's on us. You're having the greatest day of all time. Then you hop back in your car and you turn the radio on and REM comes on. Everybody hurts sometimes. And all of a sudden, your mood goes from here down to there. What do you sing? What do you sing if you're Job and someone knocks on your door? You just lost your company. And somebody else comes and knocks on your door. All your bank accounts are gone. Someone's hacked in, they've taken all the money, it's gone. Then somebody else knocks on your door. The bank's here, they want the keys to your house, your boat, everything. Then somebody else knocks on your door and they say, hey, your, your kids have all died in, in, in a freak accident. What do you sing? I'm so inspired by Job because he still praised God despite what he went through. He still praised God despite his circumstances. That's amazing. I'm reminded of the story in the Bible of Paul and Silas in prison. They're in prison. Probably the last thing they wanted to do was to praise God. They had probably a decent excuse to throw themselves a pity party and say, you know what, I'm not praising God right now. But could it be that the most important time to praise God is not when you're on your hilltop, but when you're in your valley? Could it be that the most essential time for you to worship God is not so much when life is going well, but when it's going badly, when you've lost your job or you've lost your business or your kids aren't going to school now and they're home all day and they're driving you crazy. <laughs> That's the most important time. My friend, don't lose your praise in 2020. Don't lose your perspective. Don't lose your praise. Now, for this final story, for this final point rather, I'm gonna bring in a special guest, the prodigal son. Maybe you've heard the story, but let's, let's, read the, let's read the story of the prodigal son. In Luke 15, it says this. Jesus tells them a story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share in your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. Now, a few days later, his 
younger son moved and packed up all of his belongings. He moved to a distant land. He moves out to Vegas. He says, Dad, I'm out of here. I'm gone. I'm, I'm leaving. Washington State, I'm going to Vegas. I'm gonna go party. I'm gonna go party with, with all the homies. So off he goes. He wastes his money in wild living. Him and his guys, they waste it. They're on TikTok, they're dancing. They're, they're living the life for a, for a short amount of time. Verse 14. About the time his money ran out, a great famine sweeps the land and he begins to starve. He persuades a local farmer to hire him and the man sent him in the field to feed the pigs. This young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding to the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. Ouch. I'll go home to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please make me a hired servant. So here we have the prodigal son's rock bottom moment. We've talked about Lloyd, Jim Carrey, his rock bottom moment. We've talked about Job, his rock bottom moment. And now we're talking about the prodigal son's rock bottom moment. You see, what happened to the prodigal son here was his rock bottom moment caused him to say these words, I'm going to go back to my father's house and ask him to be a servant. The tragedy of the prodigal son's story and this, the tragedy of his rock bottom moment was that he no longer saw himself as a son. Rather, he saw himself as a servant. Now, verse 20. So he returned home to his father. While he's a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son. He embraced him, he kissed him. And his son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe, put it on him. Get a ring for his finger, sandals for his feet. Kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. The son of mine, not servant, son. The son of mine was dead, but now he's returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. Let the party begin. Don't lose your perspective. Don't lose your praise. The third point is don't lose your position. Remember, in 2020, above all, you are a son or a daughter, not a servant. You're a son or a daughter. Now, the end of the story for Job, spoiler alert, works out really well. Let's see, let's see how it ends. Job 42, verse 12. So the Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life, even more than the beginning. For now he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camel, 1,000 oxen, 1,000 female donkeys. He also gave Job seven more sons and three more daughters. Now skip to verse 16. Job lived 140 years after that, living to see four generations of his children and his grandchildren. And then he died, an old man who had lived a long and full life. My friend, if you're watching this today, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. God restored back to Job not only what he lost, but he restored back to Job double for his trouble. I know for some people, 2020 may not have gone the way you intended it. And I know for some people, you identify as someone who is very much so at their rock bottom moment. But please, I'm telling you, in these moments, don't lose your perspective. Don't let your eyes go down. Keep your eyes on God. Don't lose your praise. Come on, turn off that radio and put some worship on. Put, put the right words in your mouth. And don't lose your position. Don't think for a moment that you're not worthy to be called a son or a daughter of God. Maybe you're far from God right now. Maybe you've trailed from God. Maybe you are the prodigal son or daughter and you're far from God. My friend, today would be the greatest day the greatest day to say, you know what? I want to come back into relationship with Christ. I'm far from God. I've wandered off. 
I've asked for my inheritance and I've moved to Vegas to party. But I've realized that I want to be back in my father's house again. If that's you today, it'd be so cool to pray for you right now. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you, Lord, for anybody watching today who could be far from you. Anybody who is feeling like the prodigal son or the prodigal daughter that I just described. And if you're watching this today, I'd love for you to repeat these words after me if you're far from God, if you're far from God and you want to come back into relationship with Him. Say these words, Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you today as a sinner, as someone who has fallen short. God, forgive me. I want, to, I want you to be my Savior and I want you to be my Lord. In Jesus' name, Amen. Break 
for being a part of our weekend live stream gathering. Now, if this is your first time with us, we would love to hear from you and help you get started on your next steps here at C3 Church, Southwest Washington. Simply text the word FIRST to the number on your screen and we can get you started on that process. Today, if you made the decision to follow Jesus, we have a fantastic book called Following Jesus that we would love to give to you. Just text the word FOLLOW to the number on your screen and we will send you a digital copy. If you are in need of prayer, just text the word prayer to the number on your screen so that we can join you in believing in God's best for your life. And don't forget to join us online this week for all of our upcoming events. Thanks again for being with us on the live stream today. We look forward to seeing you next time. And until then, keep stretching for more.